Kuka sunarai sunarai enti 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 Hello, welcome to this new episode of the Mango TV podcast. Today, my guest is me. I decided to publish the podcast I was invited to, the Reset Rebel podcast with Joe Yule. And for episode number 40, Joe was gracious enough to let me talk about my favorite topics consciousness, cosmic design, sexuality, regeneration. I think you will enjoy. It's the Reset Rebel. It's the Reset Rebel. It's the Reset Rebel. Coming to you every day. Welcome back to the Reset Rebel podcast with me, Joe Yule. And in today's episode, we'll be chatting to a man who's at the forefront of Ibiza's regenerative agriculture scene. But before we begin, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever thought about starting your own podcast series? Maybe it's crossed your mind, but you have no idea where to start, or you feel like your idea is maybe not quite yet ready and needs time to develop or you need to work on your voice. If any of those are true, or if you've got all the kit, but like many people I also meet and have no idea how it works, I'm running a podcast course for people like you at The Hub next month. The full details are on my website. That's ResetRebelProductions.com. Now, back to today's conversation. And I'm joined by Giancarlo Canavesio, a neo-culture entrepreneur involved in regenerative films. He makes a podcast. Um, He has commissioned many documentaries uh, on the online channel that is Mangu TV. But more recently, he started connecting into the regenerative farming scene here on Ibiza and launched Terra Viva. And more often than not, well, I'm just about to find out, perhaps getting his paws um, a little bit muddy, as he has been trying to restore the beautiful red earth of the island, as he and his family fell in love and moved here from New York a few years ago. Giancarlo, welcome to the Reset Rebel podcast. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very happy to be here. So, I mean, you know, we've kind of talked about your uh, regenerative um, obsession, I would say, in the, in the introduction to the podcast. I think it'd be really interesting from um, your perspective to just define, you know, how you see regeneration what does that mean to you so i would say you know many people talk about transformation i would say that regeneration is positive transformation so um you know for me everything started with um with psychedelic which um definitely bring some sort of um regenerative flavor to your life and um you know, neuroscience has now proved that um, those compounds uh, in the family of the tryptamines, they basically reduce the blood supply in three key areas of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, the thalamus, and the medium cortex. And by reducing the blood supply, it actually reduce what some neuropsychopharmacologists call the egoic armor. So it's a form of rebirth, is for the first time the brain is allowed, is not constrained. This default mode network is, um, they compare it to the director of the orchestra of your brain. So when the director of the orchestra of your brain go to sleep, because there is less blood in the in this uh, default mode network, they call it, then, then the piano and the guitar and the violin, they, everybody's free. There is not the grip of your egoic armor. There's not the grip of your personality of who you are. And that is the ultimate regeneration, right? Because you can reinvent yourself. The things you thought about you, you don't feel it anymore. You always thought you're very, I don't know, impatient or afraid of height or very judgmental. And then all of a sudden, you don't feel those things anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that's how my interest in regeneration started. Would you say that you had some egoic armor to drop? 
Yes, definitely so. And uh, we all have. We all have. I mean, it's incredible how Western society and Western culture really shape you from the beginning, even before you were born. Because, you know, the moment you're born, you're born in a certain family, in a certain neighborhood, and you go to a certain school. So you already take the values of your environment. So, you know, people think, oh, I'm going to shape the world. But before you shape the world, the world has shaped you. So we all have this strong egoic armor, which then it might help you in childhood. But then, you know, when you get older, I feel that this egoic armor becomes a burden because it prevents from finding your true authenticity. And that's what ultimately I connect regeneration with is authenticity. It's, it's this true authentic connection with yourself gives you mental peace and, and, and harmony. And, and, you know, if you want to discuss all these mental disease that are affecting the planet, like, you know, depression, all this depression, PTSD, bipolar, you know, all these different label that an ancient uh, discipline like modern psychiatry gives to all these conditions is really a disconnection from the self. So, yeah, so... I definitely had a strong egoic armor and I'm happy that I'm losing it. You never lose it completely and then it's not it's not gone forever. It comes back. So it's a little bit of an eternal battle between, you know, your true self and how you respond to life or your reaction. The reaction is a response filtered by the armor, or also called the trigger. I was very um, lucky to experience your full or part of your story anyway, um, recently at a talk at the Six Senses during the, uh, or in the actual launch ceremony of the uh, Alma Festival, um, which of course means soul in Spanish. And I felt like you kind of bared part of your soul actually right at the very beginning of that talk because you were talking about, you know, your journey from um, perhaps someone who's very different to the man that you are today. And I really loved the beginning of that talk. I think we, you know, I mentioned this before um, when we've spoken about it. But, I, you know, when you were speaking about there was an image of you behind bars. And I wonder if you'd be willing to perhaps talk to us, you know, when we're talking about dropping the armor and doing the work and understanding and realizing that, you know, you're on a journey and a path to evolving um, from, you know, perhaps a place of trauma. I'd be intrigued, if you will, to talk us through the beginning of what you, what you um, shared on stage. Yes, absolutely. So um, I developed this half an hour talk about my personal journey, which has been has been twenty years of 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 healing, if you want. You know, I I touched rock bottom in two thousand and two when I was arrested twice for domestic violence. So you know, it took me some time to reconcile. You know, to to make peace with this fact, uh, but. Um, I feel that now I, I can I can talk about it. It's still a bit difficult. Um, uh, you know, I was in a moment of my life when, in a very destructive relationship and uh, not knowing anything about myself and trigger and response and 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 reaction. I I went to see a, a psychiatrist in New York and saying, "Listen, I'm just feel I have this mood swing, I have this anger outburst, and I have this destructive relationship. I don't know what to do." And this doctor gave me Ritalin. He gave me amphetamine. And so, can you imagine? Now we know that amphetamines, you know, they are like they are amphetamines, you know. So they increase the anger. And and you know, I had this, as I said, this very problematic problematic relationship with the the mother of my first son, and uh, and we were fighting. And then sometimes it became physical fighting. And, and yeah, and the neighbor called the police. And, and, they, and we were so unaware about the gravity of us being taken to, to jail that we were still fighting through the jails. Because I remember they took us to the Tribeca precinct in downtown Manhattan, and they put us in the jail next door. So we would hear each other. And rather than just you know, for a second, contemplate the gravity of us being in jail. We will keep on screaming at each other from jail to jail as we were not even aware. And, and, and that's actually what I was. I was unaware on, on, 
on you know this we can we can go deeper on that i don't i don't want to bother, to bore your your listener too much but you know that anger was a symptom of of a deep disconnection with self which was coming from childhood trauma was coming from you know a situation where i was disempowered in childhood i was not allowed to to find my own voice my own sensitivity i had a very strong bigger than life father who pretty much impose on me how to be a man and um and 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 that creates all sort of of um, of addiction and um and I don't know how much you want me to talk about that well um i had the absolute honor of editing some of the episodes of your podcast so i, I you know i feel like i've listened to lots of different snippets of your story but i was fascinated with um you know, the way that you've spoken to some of your guests about the different drugs that they've sampled. Um, but, you know, when you talk about addiction, I always remember you kind of referring to um, cannabis as this kind of sneaky, sneaky little thing that kind of, you know, I don't know what you referred to at the precise terminology, but it was something that was always lurking in the background and um, perhaps, you know, um, smeared your view, I think, on on how much you needed it and kind of snuck up on you in those moments where you least expected it. So I think that might be an interesting point to touch on. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I think you had a good intuition because um, the term that uh, Graham Hanko used for cannabis is the trickster, the trickster spirit. And and I had the, probably a thirty years of addiction with with that with that medicine. It is a medicine, but it's a very tricky medicine because you know being a trickster. It, it, it persuades you that you need her more than actually you really need. And, um, and you know, what, some, what sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes happen is that, you know, people tend to smoke cannabis to release an anxiety. And it works for a little bit to reduce the anxiety. But then you have, if you smoke regularly, you have a withdrawal. So you have anxiety from the withdrawal. So cannabis is a trickster in the sense that it gives you the illusion of curing you for a symptom that originally it causes. In that sense, it's a trickster. And, you know, I went to rehab in um, in the Deepak Chopra Rehabilitation Center in, in, Vancouver, in Squamish in Canada, next to Van- in, in Vancouver. And um, and then you realize, you know, when, when, when I was there and people would ask me why you're here and everybody was there for, you know, crystal meth, cocaine, alcohol, sex, anger. And I was like, cannabis, people were laughing. But then when you start doing the work, you realize that the origin of the addiction is the same, irrespective of what addiction it is. You know, Gabor Mate, who's the world expert on addiction, had an addic- addiction to classical CDs. He couldn't help himself when he, when he, when, <laughs> when he was looking for, for, for um, he couldn't go th- next to you know a CD shop at the time without spending five thousand dollars in CDs in classical CDs and he had a major problem with the wife about that and people have many people that even we know they are addicted they are workaholic you know they're addicted to work and they're addicted to drama and they're addicted to their own story so um, so what I think prevented you know the reason why it took me so long um, to to you know to to deal with my you know for, for my healing let's say you know I feel that 2022 last year was the year when I felt okay finally I feel that you know my demons are under control they're not might not have com- be completely gone but I felt that I can see I I felt that like I relaxed my nervous system enough to to be able to see the difference between a response and a reaction. And the and, and and the time to recover from the reaction has been shorter, 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 shorter. So sometimes there's still the trigger of the reaction, but I see it, and um, and yeah. So that's why I I I, I will do the um, I will do the similar talk a little bit improved at the Power Festival uh, Power Conference in Paris on May twelve thirteen. Uh, they're gonna broadcasting online. It's a great conference mixing ancient and new technology so shamanism and web3 um and so for <laughs> for people that are curious you can log in on power.life i think i mean i love that shamanism and, and web3 i mean you know this is the world we collide with i think on a very frequent basis in a there specifically because you know 
you see shamanism now in nightclubs and spirituality, like, you know, bleeding into all kinds of areas of this island, which is kind of the number one reason that I love to be here. I feel like it's very relevant. It's very needed. Um, there are obviously certain pockets where I feel like a little bit disconnected, but I'm I'm intrigued because I think that those are the pockets that you've definitely explored more deeply um, than I know that I, I ever will in this lifetime. And I think it's, you know, admirable and and I wonder, you know, like my fear, for example, about doing something like drinking ayahuasca, which, you know, I don't think I'm probably ever going to go there. But I'm intrigued, like what what was it that made you decide to, you know, to sample and, and to try um, this medicine in the first instance? What was the number one intention behind going there? OK, I will answer the question. But before, I just want to say that, um, you know, you have this incredible curiosity. That's what, you know. That, that's why you do the job you do and so when you say you know I'll never get to this level of awareness in this lifetime I don't think so I think you will <laughs> I think you will you know it doesn't have to be ayahuasca it can be other intermediate activity like holotropic breath work takes to similar places and you can stop it I, I'll tell you more about that but so just to answer your question um, my wife she was a, a um, she was modeling in New York in the 90s and um and I don't, I don't remember actually, but for some reason, someone persuaded her to go to Peru. Um, and so she did ayahuasca very early on, uh, you know, like um, 35 years ago. Um, and, and that practice stayed with her and she then moved to Paris and she then continued. She was a little bit like um, doing the party scene in New York, but then also the the, the plant medicine in Peru and, and when we met and we decided that you know we wanted to do this and be together um, she organized a ceremony for me in Paris in a, in a, in a peniche and, uh, and it was incredible you know I, I, I didn't understand it immediately the, the, the power and the depth of it but I felt immediately that sense of, of heart opening you know because the moment you reduce your egoic armor what really happened immediately is like a heart opening. You have this incredible love for, for yourself, for the others. You feel so connected. It's, it's, it, was, it was incredible. And so since then, we started the practice of like, you know, I think seven, eight years, we went very deep doing two, three retreats every year. We, we rented a house in, in Alto Paraiso, which I think might still be one of the capital of, of plant medicine today. And uh, and uh, and it's still a practice that I recommend, but um, yeah, with the right with the right guide, with the right preparation, you know, it's like going up to a volcano, right, or up to the Kilimanjaro, up to five thousand meter mountain. You know, you, you you have to prepare. You have to prepare the, the body, the psyche, the oxygen, and 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 it wouldn't go alone. So you need preparation and a guide. I think that's you know an intriguing aspect of Ibiza to explore you know that there is a scene here just like there is a party party scene and a regenerative agriculture scene and a spiritual scene and a yoga scene there's you know there's very much a, an ayahuasca scene and I think you know I find it a little bit intriguing that this medicine is kind of taken out of its natural habitat and brought to a place like this and then kind of commercialized essentially I mean you know just like every other drug that exists here there's plenty of them um there's no shortage in Ibiza but I think I don't know if I I don't know how I feel like I don't know how I feel about that but what do you think of this kind of retreat scene that's kind of popped up and the perhaps that there's you know you talk about the integration of the medicine and what it's kind of done for you but do you think that you know there needs to be more aftercare perhaps Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, what, what people get it wrong with ayahuasca is um, when people go to this medicine with um, uh, Western um, health care. I mean, really, the, the Western um, health care paradigm is not really a health care, it's a sick care, right? I mean, people, you go to the doctor when you have some symptoms, and then the doctor prescribe things, medicine, to get rid of the symptoms right so it's really a linear thing i feel this you give me that not to feel this anymore ayahuasca it's not a substance it's a process and you know if you hear you know some of the indigenous wisdom there's a beautiful documentary called aluna on the kogi of this indigenous tribe of the sierra nevada in uh, in santa marta in colombia 
you see that um, it's it's you know this medicine opens up some portal that allow you to do the work on yourself for reconnecting with yourself and your community and your environment. The reason this medicine, you know, the way indigenous people have been using for thousands of years maybe is really to keep this harmony between the tribe, the territory, the rela- and 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 and, um, and 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 nature. So so you know the reason why indigenous um, tribe used ayahuasca is to, to to protect this connection between themselves with the with the community and with the, te- the importance of the territory and now we're taking this substance and we're taking out of the process and um you know so listen there is like two different use right there is a more ceremonial use underground which is the the circle that we know and then there is the medicalization in an hospital is now happening um magic mushroom is now being decriminalized in Oregon and Colorado i think um they expect to be able to turn mushroom into a medicine maybe if not be end of this year beginning of next year and so licensed psychotherapists will be able to prescribe magic mushroom to their clients already now but so you know l- let me differentiate between these two approaches so when you go in an underground ceremony um you know with a shaman with a group of people now it depends on the quality of the shaman like anything right if you go and like any activity the skill full of the teacher is key you know the the, the skills of the skills of the teachers are, is very important so if you have a shaman that had done an apprent- apprenticeship in the forest for like 20 30 years who apply all the criteria of ethical uh, you know selecting the participant properly uh, you know understanding if there is pre-existing condition of 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 schizophrenia if there is if there is like you know so um, prescription drugs involved and so people that do the right screening and 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 then do the right integration like you were saying you know there is there's beautiful practitioner that do all that that keep in touch with people um and and so so you know i i recommend some practitioner and i discourage others you know i just like you and like anything like you would go and i don't know take a tennis lesson and you will get it from someone who you know has been training for many years and um on the other hand i don't know if you want me to talk a little bit about the the medicalization of this compound because this is something that um you know now now this is becoming like a multi billion dollar industry you know there is company quoted at the nasdaq which will be um manufacturing this synthetic molecule uh, like cannabis like uh, salosabin but also also DMT and ayahuasca there are many companies that are synthesizing uh, um, synthetic uh, ayahuasca and then and then those you know those medicine are turning to pills you know to pass the, the, the purity test to be approved by the FDA and then licensed psychotherapists will then prescribe this medicine and then it's going to be up to them to give them the right container so give them the hours for the journey the four or five hours of being there and then there is going to be up to them to then you know try to conti- you know try to um use this medicine like it was originally conceived as a process not as a pill so will company do you know the effort of the integration of of following up with the with 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 the patient you know sometimes i feel that the force of neoliberal capitalism might infringe a little bit on the aftercare you know because ultimately integration is not really scalable right so you need more people so what's going to happen so now compass pathways is going to be the first company who will have this license to 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 produce this uh, salosabin and then is going to sell it to to the therapist or the therapist will be trained in house but then what happen when the second company will then make it cheaper because the first thing they're going to cut is the hours of the aftercare mm. so there is a little bit of that problem what what do you think about this idea though of like 
making money out of nature is is the capitalist way of life, you know, and it and it is better to be harvesting nature and using it for, you know, prescriptive medicine in that sense and making money out of it in that way. It's better than, you know, raping and pillaging and uh, you know, harvesting fossil fuels and making money out of nature in that fashion. So I don't have a problem with that, but I think ultimately there's a lot of people uh, that don't see that in a in a you know a particularly positive light or fashion. You know, the fact that psilocybin is going to become a an over the counter um, drug essentially, and obviously there is going to be a big pharma company making lots of money out of that. I mean, it, it's it's I don't know. I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean the the the, the monetization of product from nature is everywhere, you know, from 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 leather, from from you know essential oil, from anything that comes to nature. So, I'm not particularly um, you know shocked or against monetizing things from nature, you know, especially if they do it actually you know synthetically. That's is actually better because you know there is not enough supply of the of the vine and the mushroom in natu- in, in their natural habitat to now serve it to hundreds of millions of people um i think what might be the problem is either that they don't work very well because competition will erode the 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 integration and the aftercare and two it might be and then again, I welcome this this medicalization because I think it will really help a lot of people. But you know, the other side is that you know, imagine all these tribes, like in Ecuador, in Peru, in Brazil, in you know, in where all this country where there is Amazon forest, that you know, already now the children, the grandchildren of the spiritual leaders, you know, now they're having more and more internet. You know, in Peru, there's internet everywhere, even deep in the jungle. So you have this new generation of the son and grandson of the shaman that already they might, you know, connect, they're connected online. They already want to go to the city that already might not want to continue with the family lineage. And then they read on the paper on the internet that you can buy this medicine over the counter as a pill. It's going gonna, it's gonna to start getting confusing for them. You know, they hear from the father and grandfather that it's a process. It takes years. You know, there is a process of leaning the ancestors which in our Western medicalization, we don't even look at that, you know. And so this brings me to how there is a, you know, like a different cosmovision of the indigenous versus, you know, the secular scientists in our society. You know, if, if you ask, you know, the medical system comes from our paradigm, which is the secular materialistic worldview where we believe that awareness and consciousness comes from the brain, right? If you ask any scientist, they don't believe in life after death. They, don't be, they believe that you know, the, the brain, at, when it reaches a certain amount of, 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 of complexity, it creates consciousness, it creates awareness, right? So they, the, 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 the current paradigm, the current scientific paradigm sees consciousness as an epiphenomenon of the brain. So they believe that when they die and the brain rots away, consciousness disappears. This is the main principle, right? That, 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 that we are now taking in, in uh, you know, in, 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 you can't even publish paper. There is no, you know, it's, there's no evidence of survival of the soul or the spirit or survival of the consciousness. You know, like scientists don't even go there. You know, if you, in science, if you have, if you start looking at, at paranormal uh, phenomenon, you just immediately label like, you know, like a quark and a quark. And I don't know how to say. Um, so, but then what about if we just for a second, we look at the different interpretation, right? Which comes from indigenous, from the Eastern philosophy is that it's not the brain that creates consciousness, but it's the other way around. Is that it's 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 not the brain that created consciousness, it's consciousness that created the brain. So consciousness came before the brain. Mind, mind at large came before matter. So maybe there was, you know, already a pre-existing cosmic consciousness that 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 created everything. So if there was a cosmic design, then 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 that would change completely. This our worldview, you know, if 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 we think that 
this is not just one lifetime. If we feel that, you know, there is this cosmic design and sometimes in, in psychedelics, you know, the medicalization and the, the effect on your psyche of psychedelic, we discuss it, it reduces your egoic armor, it allows you to reconnect with yourself, and that's amazing. But then there is also the other aspect of the psychedelic practice, which is the spiritual practice, which is the mystical experience. So what does it mean, mystical experience? You have a tangible feeling of divinity. It's not just a textbook. It's not like a sermon. It's not Bhagavad Gita. It's not a Quran. It's not the Bible. It's not the book that tells you about this divine consciousness. You feel it. You have a sense of awe. You have a sense of gratitude. You have a sense of cosmic connection. It's difficult to explain, but you know, this literature, spiritual literature is f is full everywhere about mystical experience. So. What happened and why does it matter? You know, people would, then we go back to, um, you know, my other activity here in Ibiza is um, I'm building a, a center for, you know, sometimes I say personal transformation and, and, and personal growth. And sometimes I say spiritual growth. So what's the difference? What is, how is personal growth, personal development different than spiritual development? So, we all know what personal development is. There's, you know, Ibiza is the world capital. We have retreat all the time on, you know, coaching and empowering, empowering self, empowering the best self, um, even using now sacred sexuality to be more, um, you know, to, to explore your leadership and your ability to make money. You know, there is a lot of retreat around personal empowerment and personal development. But so the difference when you add the word spiritual is that, you know, you then allow for this cosmic consciousness or, or cosmic divinity or great mind, you know, like the Kogi, they call it Aluna. It's this consciousness, um, it, it's, it's, like a, it's like an energy where everything comes from, like you could, can call it source or God or divinity. I feel that, you know, the, the angle at which you look at your development with the, if you have a sense that, we there's something bigger i feel that it's easier i feel that you know it's easy to develop a sense of gratitude because then all of a sudden you feel small and 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 that sense of gratitude really help to go through your day and then you have a sense of awe and admiration that you feel in psychedelic where you feel the beauty of all things you know with 5 meo dmt you go to heaven, you meet God, you feel you're sitting in the hand of God and you physically feel a sense of unbounded compassion, unbounded love. And, and so that, that feelings really help in your, you know, in, in, in prioritizing your life and, and your day. And, uh, and, um, and so this is now happening, this change of paradigm of consciousness coming before the brain, um, you know, the, the the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2022 was given to these three scientists that proven the quantum entanglement, which is this phenomenon of a subatomic particle that is connected from long distance uh, by just someone looking at it. So this proof that, you know, the, the idea of the scientific idea of Object, subject, and 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 separation has been disproved. You can say that the Nobel Prize of 2022 has been has proven that we are all connected. There's no separation. I don't know how how I'm going with this. <laughs> I mean, we've gone off on a massive tangent there, which is very interesting. But I'm kind of more interested as well about your own personal story. I mean, how did you go from being an investment banker to going on a mad cosmic conscious exploration, Giancarlo? Okay, sorry, I, I, I did I did go a bit of attention. Okay, so so investment banking, I was sent to. Uh, I started a risk management company. I was sent to New York to select hedge fund manager, and then and then I met my wife, um, and then almost simultaneously, uh, I met Daniel Pinchbeck, who is this uh, New York philosopher who had wrote uh, written at the, at the time a book called um, 
um, uh, uh, breaking your head open on contemporary shamanism. Who's been on this podcast? Ah, yes, nice, nice. And some people consider him the contemporary Castaneda, and um, and so that book definitely break my break my head open. And then simultaneously, my wife organized this ceremony in Iowa, in Paris. I mentioned, and then we did another ceremony with Daniel and and this um, Brazilian filmmaker Joao Amorim. And we decided to do a documentary on Daniel's second book called 2012, The Return of Quetzalcoatl, which basically was a book making the argument that the end of the Mayan calendar would bring a tipping point in consciousness and would then, you know, be associated with a time of transformation. And, you know, if you look the world around, okay, maybe it wasn't 2012, it was you know, 2020, but like eight years on a 6,000 years calendar, it's irrelevant, right? And even the Mayan scholars, they were not saying December 2022, you know, there was like this area. And if you look at the even Western astrology with the age of Aquarius, that period in time is associated with transformation. If you look at Indian astrology, the different yugas, the Kala Yuga, also this moment in time is associated with transformation. Uh, Richard Tarnas was the head of programming of Ezalen in the 70s. He wrote a book called Cosmos and Psyche. And also looking at the transit of these two planets, I think Pluto and uh, and another one, which I don't remember, is also associated with incredible transformation. So anyway, I got really excited about, um, and also because of, of, of my psychedelic practices, about this moment in time of being a, a moment which can, you know, will allow for, you know, this planet to be better connected, more harmonious. And so slowly, slowly, I left the finance. I did more documentary. Uh, you know, I was interested in indigenous knowledge and indigenous wisdom from all the reasons that we mentioned. And I went into, a, you know, a few years of, of producing of this very esoteric documentary. <laughs> Well, you know, what is it that you get from, you know, maybe curating the contents of Mango TV? Because there's a lot of themes there. There's five specific areas that you kind of seem to specialize in. And I can see from listening to your story why those particular areas are of interest to you and have become, you know, subject matters that you like to dip into, you know, deeply and kind of share, I think, the learnings of that. And it's clear that you're passionate about the journey that you've been on and the learnings that you have experienced. And and that's kind of, I would imagine, the number one reason why you're doing, you know, particularly that content, um, you know, sharing that content and creating that channel. Yes, I feel that, um, you know, I, 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 I just feel that I went through an incredible, incredible transformation and, and, and I just want to share because I feel that so many people look at happiness in the wrong place. You know, like one of my favorite podcaster, Chris Williamson, I don't know if it's his quote, but I heard it from him. He says, the worst that can happen is that, you know, you spend your life to climb the ladder and then you're falling on top of the ladder and you look around, and you realize, oh, I'm on the wrong wall. <laughs> and and that's really resonate with me because, you know, so many people are still locked in this egoic armor that 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 inform your life in a very, you know, egoic way. So very competitive and, 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 you know, and, and looking at success from, from, from the, the, the classic criteria. And, and honestly, I have to credit my wife for, you know, all this year of exploration of psychedelic, of her keep on saying of enjoying slowing down, slowing down and listen and being still and do the meditation. And, 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 and now I don't want to sound, sound too esoteric, but the reason why I went on that, on all that, tangent before about this cosmic consciousness is because if you stay still enough and 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 you really try to to activate your body you feel this connection with this with with source you know that sounds very you know new agey blah 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 but but you know i that's why i like the psychedelic but also holotropic breath work for example if you go you know the stan Groff system of over oxygenate your brain for two and a half hours, you go through a threshold in enough, another dimension. So um, I just feel that I want to share all these practices 
Um, sexuality has been very important for me because that's an energy that I misused in, in childhood or and even in adulthood. How did you misuse it? So I, I, I had an addiction, right? So, so it was... Um, a little bit, a little bit like we said the difference between psychedelic as a product and psychedelic as a process. I think sexuality, you know, I never thought about that. It just came to mind. But in the same way, I was using sexuality as a product, you know, as a as a as a goal, as a goal to have that specific sensation and to accumulate that sensation. Whereas sexuality actually it's a process. It's a process of, of, of discovery. It's a process of connection. Uh, it's a prof- process of reconnection with self. You know, I'm new to this, but I've done it in August. Um, ISTA, level one, which I strongly recommend, um, where they really teach you that this energy is sacred. It's funny. I never really thought about sexual energy being sacred, right? But then if you look at the history, you see... There is like five thousand years of story of, of 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 you know through the through the Tao through China. There's three thousand years of of history through the Veda through India on how uh, this energy was used in a sacred way. There were like you know sacred fertility ritual, and um, and there was you know without revealing too much because they ask you at the Easter not to tell too much. Uh, there was one exercise where. It involved some nudity, and it wasn't sexual at all, but it was just a group of people very vulnerable, in very vulnerable position. And it's incredible how I felt the presence of spirit. (laughs) I felt like, you know, this vulnerability associated with the nudity and and, and the fertility, I, I don't know how to explain, but I felt a moment where I need to go there was a little temple in this, in this, a little altar in this area. I, f- I felt the need to sit down and just like, whew, I was o- overwhelmed by a sense of, of presence of spirit, just with human nakedness and vulnerability. So I discussed that with, um, with one of my teachers, Raffaele Manacorda, and he was saying that, you know, in our DNA, we have s- the connection between sexuality, sexuality and the sacred. And so this is something I want to explore with the center for sure having. But you've ignored, you've ignored the question, right? Well, when I said to you, like, what was it that you, you know, how did you kind of, you know, use your sexuality or misuse it? It, it was a, it was a typical case of sex addiction. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. So I don't think I need to elaborate on a sex addiction. <laughs> this is true. I just kind of wanted to hear, yeah, what has made you explore these different themes in your life, which are all, you know, coming into you and feeding into all of the projects that you work on that I love. And I think it's just interesting, you know, the number one thing I think that we do is, as humans when we learn things is we want to, you know, we want to share that learning and we want to give back on the lessons we've learned to help other people. And I think that's, you know, a beautiful thing that you have done. You've learned things, you've transformed, you've gone there, you've done a lot of work on yourself and you've basically decided to put that out on many different platforms and channels to try and help other people, which is, which is amazing. Yes. And um, so what, what do you want me to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I, like, I obviously would like to hear, like, how is it that you ended up coming to Ibiza from, you know, from being in New York, from living, you know, the life over there and, and doing, you know, lots of different amazing, interesting projects. But what led you to coming here? So, so as usual, happy, happy wife, happy life. So, so we've been coming to Ibiza forever for like 20 years and you know, I felt I was very happy to be the summer here, sometimes even for Christmas, sometimes even for Easter, and then being based in New York. But then my wife was like, no, 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 we should be here full time. We don't understand. It's important to be connected with the season, to live in nature, and the community here is beautiful. And New York really is becoming really crazy expensive. And, you know, they say that in New York, you have to use New York or New York uses you. So, you know, when I, were, when I arrived in the 90s, I was full of energy. I was using New York for work, for party, for everything, and it was great. And then now that we are on a different phase of our, of our life, maybe a little bit more contemplative, we felt that, you know, maybe we're not using as much. But still, I was resistant. I thought, you know, what am I doing? Ibiza in the winter. I don't want to retire yet. And then COVID hit. 
And then my wife was like, okay, so what do you want to do lockdown? In Ibiza or here? Then, of course, we picked Ibiza. And then never went back because the winter was amazing. And then also, uh, as, as a, you know, as this place, the hub in Ibiza is, is a testimonial, you know, Ibiza is becoming now also a year-round working place. You know, there's all these digital nomads coming to Ibiza. You know, the joke before COVID was that there's two types of people in Ibiza. Those that worked well in the past and then stop working and come to Ibiza, and those that never worked. <laughs> but now this has changed because there is like people from Silicon Valley, Chris Almenar is living sometimes in, in the north, in, in Portinax, is like, you know, listing company on the Nasdaq from Portinax. <laughs> so there is, um, there is really a new, a new vibe here. And, and so we never went back and we're very happy here. I'm, I'm still part time with London for uh, a number of reasons, but yeah, we're very happy here. What are the lessons you've learned from that transition from being in New York to, to being here full time? Okay. So, so, Allow me to mention just one study. <laughs> no, and then I'll tell you my personal story. I, 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 I you can't it. help yourself. I get no because I, jo- you know, two of my favorite favorite podcaster, Sam Harris, and uh, Chris Williamson. They both had this um, uh, psychologist from Harvard, Richard something. You can find it if you look at the podcast. Who's the fourth generation doctor on the longest study? on happiness ever done in this planet. It started in 1938. They took 200 people from Harvard and they start following them to understand what makes them happy. Now we are 100 years later, 90 years later, and so these 200 people gave birth to, I don't know, two, 3,000 uh, people, and they've been following these same people. And the conclusion is that what makes us happy is the quality of our relationships. So connection with others. So to answer your question, personally, in, in New York, of course, we had a beautiful community. But in, here in Ibiza, that I feel that there's more resonance. There's more interest on transformative practice. There's less interest on individualism. And then also there is more opportunity to hang with each other because, you know, we babysit each other's children. We're more involved in the school. Um, there's more opportunity to socialize, not just the party and the lunch and the dinners, but there is all these ceremonies, right? Like every week I have a group therapy, a tea and poetry, a cacao ceremony, a ayahuasca ceremony, and then an ecstatic dance. And then there is, and then there is five rhythm dance. There's now there's five rhythm and tantra. Then there is, um, you know, five rhythm and, and peyo- I mean, there is, as you know. So yeah, that's why, that's why we love it here. It's a great community and, and people People like you bringing, you know, like some, some, you know, uh, doing TEDx, attracting these beautiful speakers. Um, yeah, this is becoming the most, the best kept secret. Let's cut this out from the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I just don't know how you, you sounds like your life is very full. And it sounds like, you know, obviously it was full of different things in New York and you've kind of, yeah, regenerated your own cup essentially to, you know, work more in connection with the land as well, which I think is also, you know, another scene that's kind of springing up here in the last or five years really and and. I think that there is just a massive focus, obviously, because of climate change and the issues that um, Ibiza is facing. I mean, what would you say from the work that you do in terms of um, regenerative agriculture and the kind of projects that you're working on that you see that maybe you would like to change, um, you know, in terms of the infrastructure here? So, you know, going back to the indigenous wisdom of nature being a process and not a product, you know, um, the, if you ask a Kogi, the territory, they, they feel that the land is their brother. You know, when, when, when they pollute, when the company pollute a river, they, they say it's like taking a child away from us, right? So agri- industrial agriculture has been commodi- commodi- commodifying product, right? And, 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 and trying to doing this major, uh, monoculture to optimize profit. So having thousands and thousands of hectares of just one crop. So what happened is that, you know, nature is not equipped to defend itself with just one crop. So you have to do pesticide and fertilizer. And so the chemicals destroy the nutrients 
in, in your microbiota, reduce your autoimmune system. So it's a disaster, right? And, uh, and regenerative agriculture is a system of, of biodiversity, of crop rotation, of having different, you know, the way my mentor in agriculture, Jose Anoyaga, is the best permaculturist in the island, explained to me is that if you look at the land and you look underneath the ground and you see all the roots, you see a symphony of chemicals. So what you want to do, you want to optimize the symphony. You don't want to have too many pia too much piano, too many violin, too many harps. But so to optimize this symphony of chemicals, you need to know which plant works well next to the other one. So the one plant where the chemicals to keep the ants away, you put it next to the tomato. And, 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 and the plant that have a certain amount of, of CO2 absorption and nitrogen and all these different chemicals, you need to optimize it. And by optimizing it, you have like, you know, four benefits. One, you have a more resilient, um, uh, uh, more resilient uh, finca or, 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 or um, f uh, Bosco Biologico, they call it, where, you know, you, it can defend itself without the, the chemicals. And then you have more nutrients. Then you have more CO2 absorption. Uh, because the roots, everything is more porous. Like in Ibiza, we have, I think, one third of red soil and one third of pine, and they don't absorb the water because the red soil is, as it looks great, but it's dead, it's dead soil. There's no um, active component. So the, the water just flush away and doesn't go in the aquifer. It goes flush away to the sea. We lose it. And the pine is the same thing. It's very acidic. There's no biodiversity. Nothing grows under the pine. And same thing. It doesn't absorb neither water, no, not so much water and CO2. Instead, on a permaculture biodiverse farm, you have more water absorption, more CO2 absorption, more resilient, and better nutrients, but it's just very difficult to monetize mm -hmm. because, you know, you harvest things in different time. It's very labor intensive. You know, for a 20 hectare farm, you need five farmers and you start adding up the salary, the machine. It's very hard. So people need to understand. This is very important. When you go to a, a supermarket and you buy a cheap fruit or a cheap vegetable, that low price, someone else is paying it. Mm -hmm. Is nature is paying it in health? The government is paying in substitute in subsidies. So we really need to understand that we need to pay more for organic produce. We have to do a educational campaign that people know that a chicken that is fed with the grass from the rotation of the crop is a better health and is better, has more nutrients than the chicken in a cage fed with the corn from Argentina. You need to be able to pay three times that, you know. But How can we change that model on the island? You know, the one thing that I find most depressing here is, you know, seeing this giant influx in the summer of, you know, a couple of well, quite a few million people that come here. And of course, if only 4% of the food that is made here is eaten here, how can we change that statistic? Because um, I was interviewing somebody from a permaculture community and project in Hawaii, and they have exactly the same statistics. It's 90% of, you know, the food that's eaten there is imported. And I think that it, this is the biggest tragedy of our time. There's so many amazing people like you working towards creating a more regenerative agricultural community and regenerating the land, but we've still got the same problem. Yes. I mean, this is like, you know, people like you doing this uh, awareness campaign, you know, like pick the hotel wisely. You know, if, of course, the hospitality guys, you know, when they look at the budget, they say like, you know, food and beverage, they have a certain budget. If they buy everything from the mainland, you know, tomato by per, per kilo, the, the, they can buy chicken at like, you know, five euro per kilo instead of, of the regenerative one at 12, 13 per kilo. Of course, the ultimately, the hospitality people, they don't care, right? They have to like, you know, maximize the shareholders uh, value. But then, you know, what I would say, you know, we need we need um, we need customer to vote with their wallet, you know, try to ask, try to pick the agroturismo or the hotel that use organic problem request uh, product requested 
um, you know, don't book the big chain. Uh, there are some organic certification now for hospitality. You want, um, you know, that's that's. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's 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 an awareness, it's an educational campaign, and and it's happening here. And also, you know, Ibiza. I feel strong that Ibiza could be an example for the world because there is a the problem is that a lot of land has been abandoned or mis or, or, or underused, right? Because the son of the payes, the son of the local farmers, they don't want to be in agriculture. They want to work in turismo. They prefer to be a barman or even a taxi driver than being in the field, right? In the field is considered the low level job uh, to the younger generation. So what happened is that, so that's one thing, the son of the farmers don't want to be a farmer. And then the second thing is that Tourism has pushed up the value of the finca, of the house in the farm, so high that then the, all these landowners, they rent the finca for 50000 a year. The kid doesn't want to be a farmer. So what happens is that they don't care about using the land. So the land has been abandoned. And that's the bad news. But the good news is that it never been sprayed. You know, try to go and resuscitate the land in Catalonia or in Andalusia where it has been sprayed for 40 years. That land is defunct. You can see the rock, how compact it is. It's very hard to, you know, it's pretty dead. The land in Ibiza is just dormant. You know, it's very easy to resuscitate. So there is an opportunity here for regenerative farmers to activate this land, you know, like um, Jessica Dunlop from uh, Bank de Terre, she's doing a great job putting together underused land with uh, farmers. What's the problem is that the financial system, you know, everybody's trying different things. We are using this hybrid hybrid philanthropy um, uh, model. Um, Christian with Junto is using, you know, he wants to do a bigger, a bigger. Um, Play on the on the on the brand on on then I don't know I don't want to talk actually about uh, on his behalf but um, I feel that there should be an educational campaign for people to be willing to spend more for for uh, regenerative products. I think that's a beautiful thing and absolutely you know is you know as you say the way that people can vote with their wallet but essentially you know I really still see tourism here as being as you explained the monoculture and it has taken over as we saw during COVID when people were queuing up at the food banks and they were unable to make ends meet there was a real problem when tourism was taken out of the mix so you know ultimately I see the kind of solution for the island and the land and everything the ecosystem here that exists of the people that kind of ship in from elsewhere and reside here because they fall in love with the island versus the people that are from here is the same issue is that everything is supported by this one monoculture which kind of isn't working with the toxic waste the overload of the systems the inability to feed the people that come here which means that everything has to be imported just continue you know perpetuates this cycle of degradation of this island and I think someone like you is in a position to maybe start to chip away at changing that kind of thing which is a really exciting position to be in and I just kind of wonder what would you perhaps what do you see as the solution you must have thought about it so you know we are in the same business of 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 creating you know like conscious media and and so i'm now in, in los angeles we have an editor cutting a, a, a movie um, on regenerative agriculture we were here two years ago filming regenerative farmers and regenerative chef so that's going to be a movie that we're going to premiere in ibiza we're going to create try to create awareness around that but you know it's 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 a tough battle i mean imagine even for like sugary drink in america i mean everybody knows that coca cola is bad for your kids right but then you have mothers to supermarket buying coca cola for the kids you know that video games are bad for the kids but then you know it's it's um there are so many things that are bad for your health and and still people keep on doing so I think it's 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 uh, it's it's education, education, education. You know, at Terra Viva, we're doing now. We're gonna do a series of event. We're gonna do a Sunday roast where we're gonna um, um, entertain people with our product. Uh, Andrea Abad, the, the the director of the Terra Viva, is doing all kind of retreat and workshop, and we are partnering with all local organization from the Association of um, Organic Farmer and the Permaculture and the Bisa Produce to do event, an educational event. So I'm doing whatever is possible to educate people. You know, people need to be willing to spend more for regenerative 
products. <laughs> mm. Well, what do you say then out of all of these themes that we've kind of uh, touched on today? You know, what's the one thing that is your maybe your intention for the immediate future? What's the thing that you're focusing on or perhaps most passionate about in this, this current moment? So what really turns me on is when I see in the eyes of someone connecting the dots, right? When when someone writes me saying, oh, your talk really helped me because I realized that I had subtle trauma. It's because, you know, that one thing we talk on the, on the, I don't want to go on a long tangent, but just briefly, you know, one thing that people, now trauma is a big topic, Gabor Mate. New doc, uh, Wizard of Trauma is out. Everybody's talking about trauma. Trauma informed this, trauma informed that. And it's great. And it's very important. But one thing people don't, still don't pay attention is that there is the big trauma that we remember, right? Like we were beaten, we were abused, we were, um, there was a dead in the family, there was a car accident, there was like my, there was the war. And that's all the trauma you can't forget. But then there is the subtle trauma or micro trauma, which is the the thing which is a little bit less memorable, like you know, lack of positive reinforcement, l- lack of, of 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 presence, of love. You've been maybe people that kids were taking out of school, age four, and then again at six and seven, and the, an absent father, and non emotionally supported, and disempowered, and the memory repressed that, and so then you grow up and you say, well. I had a happy childhood because, you know, my friend was beaten up. I was not. But you were ignored and neglected. And that still creates a subtle trauma, like a, psycho, like a neurological injury in your psyche that then gets reinforced through life. Um, so what really turns me on is when I can use my personal experience in, 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 in putting the, piece, the puzzle piece together so someone else can see that. You know, that's and, and, and so I do that with the podcast, with the blogs, with the documentary, and now with the center where, you know, in Sapenia, we, we're building a center, we're building a bar, we're building a restaurant, we're building a shop. There's going to be some uh, seasonal uh, rentals. And we'd love to have Sapenia to be, you know, a, a destination for uh, gastronomy. You know, my partner Boris Bueno calls it the gastro hood for spirituality. And also for fun, for music, we have a music license at the at the at the bar. So yeah, that's what turns me on. And then there's every six months there's something new. <laughs> What's your perception of Sapenia currently? So Sapenia, it's a, it's it's a crazy story, right? Because it was occupied by the gypsy for many years. And, and, and so there was this incredible, it was like a Wim Wenders movie, right? Like completely surreal. You had that villa when you have the big palace and the big families and you have this like $50 million townhouse in that villa. And then the marina with the, you know, the Puff Daddy Valentino, the Sultan of Brunei or something, or Prince of Kuwait. There was like $100 million boat. And between the $50 million townhouse and the $50 million boat, there was this liver of land full of chicken and old woman and, and, and children and, and, and birds and flamenco and dealing drugs. And, and for, I don't know, 50 years, people didn't even like, know the existence of this little reality. And so, so with some partner, we start, we started to buy some of these ruins in 2016. And now, now the, 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 the government has uh, built, uh, uh, at, in the heart of Sapenia, uh, there's like eight or nine houses, which has, is rent controlled and they gave it to the police and their family. So that's really now is keeping the peace and uh, every day is getting better. You can walk around day and night. There's no more, um, they're almost all gone. It's definitely the problematic one are gone. The, the, the place where they're selling drugs, they're all closed. There were three or four of them, and now they're closed. And uh, so, so, yeah, it's getting better. What about the kind of the gypsy community that I think um, perhaps feel slightly affronted that they, you know, they've been removed? I mean, they were squatting illegally, right? They were selling drugs. So, you know, also I think the government gave them alternative location in, in Mallorca and in, in the mainland. And uh, so, so you know, they're all gone, really. Now, if you go walk around, there's like maybe three, four families, and uh, they're not problematic. They are pretty integrated. And uh, I'm, you know, I I rented the first apartment for uh, two years for a long rent to a Norwegian shaman that um, uh, is he works in a tradition of Alberto Villoldo, which is the Cuero tradition. These tribes in the Andes. 
And so he's now working to energetically activate Sapenia. So he um, find the four cardinal points in four key areas of Sapenia, and now he's working around every week doing this energetic ceremony with, with crystal and cobalt and different things. And, 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 and now we are trying to, you know, integrating the community, mostly expat, but also resi- also Spanish and Ibisenk, to, um, to join uh, the, the Norwegian shaman in this practice. And, um, you know, especially when we're going to have the bar, I will try to, to, to reactivate this neighborhood. It's very exciting. Wow, reactivating, regenerating. I mean, any other? What's your favorite reword? <laughs> I, I think the regeneration is is um, is a good term. Um, you know, it, it implies some sort of uh, reinvention. You know, I think that the only constant is change, and um, I yeah, I, I encourage people to to keep on trying new things. You know, one thing that for me really helped is you know this fear of vulnerability. You know, this is something that paralyzes most of us. This, you know, we don't like to be vulnerable because, you know, vulnerability is rooted in shame and we don't want to try things we're not comfortable because we have this fear of failing and we're feeling vulnerable and, and so we're paralyzed. And this is such a shame because there's so many people that with a little bit more courage and a little bit more incentive, you know, then can really contribute to this you know, consciousness revolution. And, uh, you know, Brené Brown is an expert on that. She has TED Talk and and, 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 and Netflix special and book on, on, on that. And she says that, you know, it's it, you have to find the courage to feel vulnerable. That's where there is growth. So, so that's, for me, regeneration implies a form of embracing your vulnerability to becoming something else. Interesting. Thank you so much for... Uh opening up and being vulnerable today on the the podcast it's been very interesting to hear your perspective on so many different topics and I mean I feel like we could probably you know record about another four or five hours with the amount of fingers and um, pies that you've uh, kind of been exploring since you got to Ibiza but um, yeah thank you for making time to to be here yes and thank you thank you to you you know you are uh, you might know this but you are one of the two obstetrician of the Mango TV podcast because um, Oliana from uh, do you remember the name of Oliana's podcast um, anyway we'll, we'll figure the Ibiza Refuge for Dreamers the Ibiza Refuge for Dreamers she, she, she had me on the podcast and I saw how it was easy to just a microphone and a recorder you could do this and, and she inspired me to look at that and then I took a class with Joe and she uh, helped me with everything, with equipment, with, with, with the editing, and she edited the first few episodes. So I'm extremely grateful to her. And I encourage all of you to start your own podcast. That's a really, really, really low barrier of entry. You know, like I, I used to produce documentary and I still do, but that's so expensive compared to just a microphone. You just need a microphone and some battery. I, I, if, you're, if you're on the fence, go for it. Thank you for that. <laughs> little cheeky advert at the end and we'll see you again very very soon Giancarlo thank you it's the reset rebel it's the reset rebel it's the reset rebel coming to you every day Coca sonara y sonara y en ti. 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 Coca sonara y sonara y en ti.